All right. Uh, welcome back to the Barbell Lifestyle Podcast. Today, we are so excited to introduce an amazing guest. Uh, like this woman literally does it all. And I was just like doing, doing my research, like making sure I was up to date on everything she was doing. And I was like, holy crap, like, like she does so much. So she has done bodybuilding competitions, has competed in powerlifting. She is a board member on the NCGM, uh, which is the Nutrition Coaching Global Mastermind. It's something that I've been a part of and uh, has raised my awareness to her and her work. Board member on the Sports Nutrition Association. She is an RP, Re Renaissance Periodization Coach. She has her own coaching community, the Comprehensive Coaching Community, I believe. Um, she has her PhD. She got that from Virginia Tech. Um, go Hokies, Christina, also Ooh. Hokie. <laughs> Um, and she has transitioned from being an academic to a coach. And we are just so, so, so excited to have her on because there are so many things that we could talk about. And I would love to talk about all of them, but we would be here for like eight hours straight. Um, but, you know, she goes from, you know, studying gut health to behavior change, to intuitive eating, to diet culture and anti-diet culture. And there's so much great stuff that goes on in this woman's mind. So uh, everybody, seriously, uh, you are in for a treat this episode. So today we have Dr. Gabrielle Fondero. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and we are just so stoked to have you on. So thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. Hopefully I don't disappoint now. Like, like, <laughs> or up here. And then I show up and I'm like, hey, I got a hoodie. I'm just working at home. I'm in my <laughs> Hey, I'm right there with you. If you're watching we on YouTube, are. we're all super casual. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be comfortable to get the hamster wheel rolling. Oh, definitely. Benefits of, of what everyone learned in 2020, right? <laughs> yes. So uh, it's, we just want to start by having you kind of tell your story uh, and just let the audience know who you are, where you came from, and uh, you know how you got into all of these different things uh, along the way. Oh man, I mean, I guess the answer to that is just like an insatiable curiosity and um, trying to do my best to help people. So when, um, so I started uh, my kind of academic career actually as a music therapy major. So um, I sang for, for my entire life and I wanted to um, apply music to help people um, process and express themselves. So I think I've always um, had a desire to connect with people in that way. But I realized that music for me was really a passion and a hobby, but not something that I wanted to make a career out of. And in the meantime, I had actually started exercising in the way that a lot of people, and I think maybe especially women exercise, was to try to not gain the freshman 15. So I went to college and I received this message that like when you go to college, you usually gain weight. And of course, you know, that's one of the scariest things for an 18 year old girl to think about. Um, and so that's when I started exercising and I got into um, lifting so I could be stronger for rock climbing because my gym had an indoor climbing wall. Um, and so I shifted to exercise science as my major and then realized that I really loved anatomy and physiology. I was um, super keen on learning about skeletal muscle phys specifically. And I ended up tutoring my classmates to the extent that at the end of the semester, um, my A&P professor caught wind of that and he actually invited me to give a guest lecture on renal physiology. And so I, I went out and like got a little outfit and stuff and like came in and and delivered this lecture on renal fizz. And I thought, man, you know, if I would do this for free for hours a week, maybe it's something that I should make into a career because I wasn't totally sold on the idea of owning and running a gym. So um, I just, I decided my junior year that I wanted to be a professor. And so I was like, the next step, I've got to get a PhD. And so I um, served as a research assistant for my uh, post-bachelor's internship um, and you know where everyone else is kind of like going to the gyms and whatnot I had to get a letter from my mentor um, to you know in support of, of my pursuit of this internship in a research facility instead of going to something that seems more practical so I did that and um, that was at Virginia Tech so I was at the corporate research center and um, then went on to apply for the PhD program there 
um, under Dr. Matt Holbert and um, was studying the effects of high fat feeding on skeletal muscle metabolism. And I really got into the realm of gut health um, kind of on accident because we were uh, treating mice with something called lipopolysaccharide and it causes a sort of inflammatory cascade and metabolic dysregulation that we can measure in the, the skeletal muscle that we extract from them. And I was curious about why we were doing that. You know, what's the physiological phenomenon that this is supposed to be um, mimicking? What's the relevance to humans? And I learned that this is something that comes from certain bacteria that reside in the gut. And when they die, this uh, is, it sort of like breaks off from their cell wall and then combine to um, immune receptors in humans. And we have these immune receptors sort of in a bunch of different tissues throughout the body. And it's one of the um, mechanisms that's been implicated in the development of type two diabetes. So I thought, well, why aren't we getting to kind of like the, the, the core of the issue here and you know, looking at what's going on in the gut why is it that some people have more of these bacteria? Why is it that we see more of this LPS when people are eating a high fat meal? And uh, eventually my, my advisor conceded <laughs> to my requests to look in that area because it wasn't you know, what we were, it wasn't what our lab was really set up to do. Um, so fast forward a few years, I'm teaching in exercise science um, in Georgia. I've been teaching for about four years um, when Dr. Mike Isratel from RP uh, found me in the International Society of Sport and Nutrition Facebook group. I was having a collegial debate and I guess he, he was impressed by the way that I was communicating. And I had at that point a really little, like just a tiny little sport nutrition blog. And um, he ended up recruiting me to RP, to be an RP coach. And about a year uh, into both teaching and coaching, I realized I had um, you know, just a, a real passion for coaching. And that was the dynamic that I really was seeking. You know, as an educator, I could connect with a lot of students in that way, but I wasn't getting that same sense of, I can really help this person to make a change because higher ed to some extent has been kind of commodified. You know, people will show up and you say like, where's my A? I showed up to class, give me my A. Just want to <laughs> Um, so, you know, I was, I wanted to connect with people that really were eager to, um, you know, change and kind of explore themselves as well. <laughs> so I started vitamin PhD, uh, nutrition telehealth, which gave me also a little bit of a different dynamic, you know, having a sort of a face-to-face -face conversation with a person, um, I think opens even more doors, um, and, and greater capacity you know, to, to evoke change and, and have some kind of more challenging conversations. And then I made the decision to leave academia, which was super scary because it's like, you know, you get your pension your, and, and, you know, all your benefits and everything like that. And you have a salary. Um, and then to leave that um, right before deciding like, oh, okay, I have to go up for promotion now or, or leave. And so I decided to leave. Um, and went to coaching full time. And I've had the amazing opportunity to now speak um, internationally about the gut microbiome and, uh, and behavior change. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel very fortunate that RP is supportive of my other pursuits. And, um, you know, we uh, are an awesome team and I'm collaborating with Shannon and um, it's just been a, a wild ride. And I think the, the root of it, the reason that I talk about these topics that seem kind of maybe dissonant or, or, or you know, completely unrelated is really to help um, clarify misconceptions and ensure that people are fully informed about whatever choice they want to make without feeling any shame or guilt um, in any direction and to challenge the, the healthism um, that exists that manifest as things like fad diets or um, you know, myths and bogus um, supplements in the realm of gut health. You know? So it's, it's kind of challenging that um, and really talking about these sort of contentious topics and giving people an open platform to do so. Because I don't think that we can really see effective change um, if we have a lot of shame being tossed back and forth 
uh, when people are really doing their best and making mistakes. That doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's doing good or, or doing well, <laughs> um, or that their best is appropriate. But I think that if we can take a charitable view, um, to quote Eric Helms, that probably will do us better than being um, really blamey and shamey. Um, so trying to kind of like suss that out and see how we can maybe approach that um, as an industry. Wow, I love that. That's a lot to, to unpack. So I think it's really cool though to our listeners who maybe who are in school and you know they're studying something right now maybe because they think it is a safe choice or they think that that's what they wanna do but it's okay to change and to, to try out different majors and to try out different careers. Um, but eventually just to follow your passion and eventually have that be your career. Cause if you can talk about something for hours and hours and hours, like, I mean, it's obvious that you, you enjoy doing that and could probably help others in some capacity. That's really cool. Yeah. I used to tell my students when I would advise, advise them and they were considering making a change. I would just ask them, what do you like to do in your free time? And I probably sent uh, well, quite a few students to other majors outside of exercise science. <laughs> And I'd rather have them happy somewhere else than miserable in exercise science. You know, like if it's detailing cars, if it's building computers, um, go do that. Like give the world something you're passionate about. And you got your PhD in 2014, correct? It was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think that that's really interesting too, because gut microbiome and in gut health was not popular at that time. Um, I would say that it's blown up within the past couple of years and now everyone on Instagram is a gut health coach and guru. Um, but again, I think it's really cool how you were studying something and it led to something else. Um, yeah, it was, yeah. it was serendipitous and it was really Dr. Mike's idea. He was like, don't, don't you do something with gut health? And I was <laughs> like, yeah, you the gut microbiome, but like, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, my super passion. And he's like, well, you know, this seems to be kind of a hot topic right now. Like it might blow up soon. And that was in 20, 2018, 2017. So it was like very, like very much at like the, the outset of that. So he really predicted that. Um, and then I had my first podcast about it with Revive Stronger, I think in like June, 2017 or something. Um, so yeah, it's been just in the past couple of years and it's been like this snowball effect. I was like, oh, one podcast. And then the next month, oh, another podcast. Then it was two and then four and then seven in one week. I don't do that anymore. I can't help it. Um, yeah. So it's been great. You know, I'm, I'm always, um, just thankful and, and grateful for the platform, but the more that we talk about it, you know, and, and the less that we really know about it, the more gray area there is. And that's where we, um, that's where those myths and whatnot exist. We just don't know any better. And, and so this is just what um, serves as a surrogate until we get quality information. Yeah. I mean, people don't know what they don't know, right? So um, we're here to tell them that and hopefully give you another platform of unique individuals that you can speak to. Um, so I kind of want to direct the conversation uh, from what you were saying about, um, you know, we can't make behavior change just by shaming people to uh, you know, be better or, you know, just pointing out, you know, hey, this is, you know, when we're coaching, when Christine and I are coaching, and I'm sure when you're coaching as well, we get a, what we get some kind of report from our clients, whether it's data or qualitative data, or just observations, how someone's feeling um, and how someone feels that they did over the past week or however long the period is between check-ins. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, at our nature is, you know, we want to help people and we come from this place of we really, really want to just get in there and make this person's life better. But sometimes that can manifest itself as like really being quick to point out those things like, oh, you could do better with this. Oh, you could do better with this. You could increase your protein. You could be more, you know, consistent. You could, you know, not skip that cardio session or whatever it is. And I think we've definitely come a long way. And I know I per personally, I've come a really long way with being able to voice that in a way that is encouraging and empowering. Um, and, and I think that's huge because behavior change is, is hard and behavior change is something that I think, uh, you know, us in the trenches here in the evidence-based health and fitness space, you know, this is our lifestyle. So it's hard for us to remove ourselves from that bubble of like, okay, what is it like to have this be your first time ever pursuing a fitness journey or, you know, pursuing a healthier lifestyle? 
and, and, you know, what does that feel like and how scary is that? And, and what are the barriers to entry? And so um, we would love to hear you kind of just give an overview and bring us into this topic about, you know, what really is behavior change and how does that work for people? Mm, you brought up so many good points. Um, so I um, define how I coach, my approach to coaching is to help people decide what they want to do and then help them do it. So I think that as I am existing in this space um, in sort of like the midst of a lot of debate about personal responsibility and behavior change and how we can affect that and um, the most effective way of being with a person, of being with a client. And you know, talking about, like you said, you know, barriers to entry. The more aware I am of the intrinsic and, and implicit involvement of things like socioeconomic status, race, um, a person's um, social support network, their job, the demands of their actual real life and the, the stigma or the prejudices that they faced in the past. That I think we can take this sort of reductionist view of behavior change and say, well, this is the most effective way of like forming a new habit. <laughs> this is the most, oh, if you wanna get you know, to your five a day. And we might miss the steps before that we might miss the, the person, like the context of the person for whom we're trying, to whom we're trying to apply this behavior change technique. There are a bunch of different behavior change techniques. And if we look at it in a very technical way, we can say, well, sort of, you know, if we look at the trans theoretical model as sort of, you know, this academic construct and then say where they are maybe in this stage of change, then we can look at which processes of change. That's really cool in its own right, but when we're talking about working with actual people um, and, and we're not kind of identifying our own biases, we might not be the best helper, the best guide that we can be because we might have the assumption, well, you know, this person is just not putting in enough effort. They don't want it bad enough. Oh, it's easy to get up at this time of day. And, you know, so we get a lot of these messages, a lot of these sort of like bootstraps, um, self-help messages. Not to say that there is anything wrong with a sense of personal responsibility. Um, and not to say that, you know, that doesn't resonate with some people because it surely does. But really when I'm working with a client, it's, you know, to really get to know who they are as a person. That is probably, I think the most, the, the best foundation that we can have to form a productive dynamic with a person. Um, so, and, and that comes from my, you know, my philosophy is very much aligned with motivational interviewing and it as at its core as a way of being with someone. It's, it's not a way to make them change or a way to get someone to change. Sometimes you're not even really talking about change. You can apply the spirit of motivational interviewing. You can give someone a safe space to, to, to talk about change or other things without necessarily having like expecting that a change will be made. So the root of behavior change really, I think, is giving a, a person a safe space to be as they are right now. And then when they decide that they want to make a change, ensure that they are able to provide informed consent so that they know the risks and benefits of whatever decision they want to make, whatever direction they want to go. So um, if they want to pursue intentional weight loss, if they want to pursue a weight neutral approach, um, so that's kind of like the, the top down view, you know, that these, that, that we are not siloed, that people are, um, you know, to use the term that people might be familiar with, but intersectional. So, you know, we are at the intersection of our previous experiences and who we are, who we think we are, who we think other people think we are, you know, so we are operating under sort of this set of societal constructs and expectations. So for example, if a woman wants to lose weight and we want to um, help her to develop some internal motivation, because that is really what's helpful for long-term motivation. 
most cases, when people want to lose weight, they're starting from a place of external motivation. So there are some external factors regulating their behavior. They're, they might feel shame about their body size. They might have joined some sort of um, fitness like competition or um, you know, an office like weight loss contest. And so they have an external reason. There's a reward or they're trying to avoid a punishment. And that can be a strong initial source of motivation. But if we want something that's more lasting and we want to then maintain the, the behavior over time, we need to shift to something that's more internal. So we have to figure out why it's important for her to lose that weight. Why is it meaningful to her? Then we might unpack that the reason that she wants to lose weight is because she's ashamed of her body. And it's because of weight stigma that she's experienced in the past. Um, and then, well, what do we do with that? Like, you know, how, like, is there an ethical consideration when, when we're helping a person to pursue a change and the reason for that change is that they don't like themselves? I don't know, that's a hypothetical question. But, but this is where I am right now when I'm in this weird place, you know, helping people with behavior change. You have the very practical applied um, approaches of how you can potentially help a person change their behavior. But at the source of it, when we're trying to figure out why they want to change that behavior, we might run into some difficult topics, you know, and then do we have a responsibility as practitioners to either, okay, I maybe I need to refer this person out because they have some um, things to process that, that I'm not that person for, or do we potentially unpack that and see, you know, what is it really about the weight loss that's meaningful to you? You know, is it going to help you feel more accepted? Um, do you believe that it will make you feel more confident and improve your body image? You know, that might not actually be the case. But, you know, Marissa, as you mentioned, we have to be very careful about how we're providing that information because we want to respect the, the client's autonomy. Um, and also, a lot of times, just giving someone information is not super helpful unless they've requested it. <laughs> so avoiding that writing reflex where, you know, we want to help people but um, sometimes we want to help them in a pushing or a pulling way. And it's about stepping back and helping in a guiding way and providing information to them um, with their permission uh, and then asking for their feedback on it and letting them come up with the solutions. And sometimes people will realize that what they thought they wanted initially, lose weight, is not what they really, really wanted. They wanted to have better body image. They wanted to feel more confident. They wanted to feel more desirable. And maybe the weight loss didn't get, give them that. And what can happen then is, you know, they've reached their goal. Maybe you've reached it together. Um, and their expectations, their unstated expectations, their unrealized expectations weren't met. And so they feel disappointed, even though they reached their goal. Um, but just because kind of that deeper work wasn't done, not out of like negligence on the on the place of the coach, just because like, that's a lot of really heavy work to do. And it's not something that everyone wants to do. And that's totally okay. I think that it's it, going back to what you were saying before, it's like you have kind of, if you're going through and getting your uh, coaching certification, you're reading the textbook and it's like, here are the behavior stages. And if they're here, then you do this. And everything sounds really good in a, in a textbook, but actually applying that to a real life client who has you know, things that are going to go on in their personal life and their, like you mentioned, their, their backgrounds and their beliefs and biases and things that they've heard. Um, there's a lot more than goes into it than just here's some information. Here's me answering question. Behavior change is actually really difficult sometimes, especially if you have a client who maybe doesn't really know exactly what they want or what they're trying to achieve. So you made a lot of really good points about things to think about when you are basically in taking a client and you have so much to unpack with them. It's not just, okay, five pounds, let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, wow. I mean, there's just so much that I wanted to touch on in, in what you said. And I don't even think I'm gonna remember half of it, but some <laughs> of the notes that I was writing down, cause I knew I would like, I would lose it. Cause you'd go off on, on the next uh, topic and I'd be like, oh, and there's more and there's more. <laughs> but, um, I think that's a really good place to start, Christina. Um, and you kind of touched on this in the beginning. Um, when someone is coming in to you and, and they're meeting you and they, I mean, when we 
intake clients is because they've kind of already made a decision in their mind that they want to make a change. Um, mm-hmm. But then when we do take these people in and maybe we start to implement these healthy habits and lifestyle changes with them, we start to see these things come to light. You know, um, those people that, you know, our gut reaction is like, oh, they just don't want it bad enough because they're not trying or whatever it might be. Maybe that's because the outcome that they stated that they wanted was not actually the outcome that they, they really need or, or maybe they don't un- understand how to fully express what they actually want. So for example, I see a lot of women, especially of course, um, with, with culture today, and that's a whole nother rabbit hole, but um, they come in and they say, I wanna lose weight, I wanna lose body fat. And I like how the narrative is now shifting a little bit more towards, I wanna to be strong, muscular, and still lean and toned, but it's going away from that, you know, being very skinny to being very strong. And I love that. Uh, so we get that dialogue and we hear, okay, that's great. That's what I'm trained to do. I got my certifications for this. I read the textbook. I know how to help you do this, right? And then they come in and I see this happen a lot where they they start to lose the weight or they, they get to their goal weight or whatever it was. And, um, you know, I'm not really big on, on setting outcome-based goals in that, in that way, but, you know, these people, they come in with, with a number in their head, usually, whether they say it to me or not. Um, and so maybe they get there um, or we, we do, you know, state like, hey, this is a, a rough range of where we want to end this fat loss phase. And they get there and they still just have that extreme dissatisfaction with themselves. And that crushes me because, uh, you know, ultimately we want that weight loss to give them the confidence that they, that they so desire, but that's not always the case. Um, and so a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I try to approach this from a way of, you know, let's use process oriented goals. Let's focus on checking off the wins every single day of, you know, I, I did, you know, get all of my, my meals and I felt really good about, you know, what I put in my body today or, Um, You know, I hydrated myself and I I made that a priority and I feel really good about that or, uh, you know, focusing on how great it feels to finish a workout or to feel strong at the end of a workout or a session. So we have those process oriented goals that are, you know, in turn building a little bit of self-efficacy and self-confidence over time. Um, And I encourage journaling for a lot of my clients and self-reflection and not just thinking about the the numbers because we all have Excel sheets. Like that's how we collect our data, right? We need that data. But uh, in those Excel sheets, I like to get qualitative data. So how's your quality of life? You know, how do you feel? How's your self-confidence? How's your uh, mood? How's your energy? And so looking for those things as well, because it helps the client to kind of better understand and reflect what's really, what's really going on in these changes that are happening, not just in their body. Um, but yeah, it's really difficult to, to get to that root of like, Hey, you know, the outcome that you stated might not be where, where you really need to end up, um, to be the, the end result that you want to be that confident person. Um, how do you communicate that? Uh, this is not on our outline, but you know, how do you communicate that to a client? And and how, you know, I think motivational interviewing is a really big part of it because we're asking them to reflect and discover upon themselves what it is that that we're really trying to you know elucidate or like guide them towards. But how do you do that? Hmm. That's a tough one, um, and I think it's especially tough with email clients because it's difficult to express the empathetic spirit um, and the evocative and and compassionate spirit uh, via text without body language, without tone of voice. Um, Because let me give you an example. So someone tells me, I want to weigh 140 pounds or whatever. And um, they say, you know, and, and in the past I used keto to get there. And I go, okay, um, what was important to you about that? Why, why do you say 140 pounds? Um, how'd it go for you when you were doing a keto diet? And then they know that I'm, I'm inviting them to tell me that. But if it's via text, when they read it, it could sound like, 
oh, why do you want to get to 140 pounds? How the keto diet work for you? So it's, there's a barrier sort of to communication when we're talking about delicate topics. Not to say that it's not possible, but just that we may need to be um, very careful in how we're phrasing our questions and like use emojis. I use emojis and smiley faces and stuff a lot in my emails so that people know that I'm asking these questions with kindness and curiosity because really like I'm not, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing a keto diet. I wanna know what helped, you know, what worked for them in the past um, and why 140 pounds is their, is their target number. And quite often, when you ask, you know, what is it about X that's important to you? Um, what were your experiences like last time? Or um, what was the process of getting there? And um, what do you think, uh, or another question that I'll ask is what needs would be met if you were to do that? Because some people are like, I wanna start counting macros again. I hated it before, but I feel like I need to do it again. And I'm like, okay, what need would be met? And then we can start talking about what they actually want. What does that body size, that the in, in their mind, they have a picture of them in that body. And then there's a life surrounding it. Like their life is different because they're in a different body. Um, and the problem is obviously that, what, that quite often um, body image doesn't really improve with, with changes in body composition. Um, that body dissatisfaction does not seem to um, uh, choose, you know, one, one body type. And a person's body can change without any change to their body image. Um, and their body image can change without change to their body. And that even though there are psychological benefits in some cases to intentional weight loss, uh, and people do, do report increased self-efficacy and even increased self-esteem, Self-esteem is different from body image and it's different from self-worth or self-compassion. Self-esteem is achievement-based. So I feel good about myself because I lost this weight. Um, and then I don't feel as good about myself when I regain the weight. And the reality is that a majority of people will regain lost weight. Not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but we just need to set up the expectations that this is a reality there are ways to prevent that from happening if you choose to do so. Um, but if we don't do that internal work um, of focusing on body image sort of separately, then the person could end up, yes, at their goal weight and um, not with their goal life, not with their goal sense of self. But um, what, what we need to be aware of when we want to communicate this information is that again, you know, just giving someone a piece of information without sort of the, the permission to do so or um, evoking their desire for more information, it might not be as effective. So when I'm having a conversation with a person about, you know, their ideal body or their ideal size, and I'm getting some information about what it means to them, um, usually there is, a, there is an opportunity to bring up, um, you know, body image work. And it can just be, oh, you know, like, have you ever, like, have you ever thought about um, reading this, this one book? First asking, can I give you some information? You know, it sounds like you have some, um, you're expecting this and this to be different for you um, with your body, with your body, you know, this specific size. Sometimes, and, and this is all with good rapport with the client. You know, this isn't a conversation that I would have with someone just like right off the bat. But um, sometimes I'll even ask, you know, it sounds like you've been um, at this weight in the, in the past and it seems like you were still dissatisfied with your body. Um, you know, why do you think that might be? You know, what would be different this time around? So to very gently just explore the possibility that maybe getting that specific body will not... Um, improve their body image. And then to perhaps even integrate that into what you're doing, you know, that like you brought up such a great point when we're talking about these, you know, process oriented goals and journaling and whatnot, you know, some of the aspects of, of body, positive body image would be um, uh, the appreciation of body functionality. And it, it doesn't have to be um, functionality that looks like everyone else's functionality, but just the functionality of your personal body. What do, do your senses allow you to do? Um, what do your limbs allow you to do? You know, what does your body do functionally 
that allows you to engage in your life in an enjoyable way, regardless of how it looks externally, you know, regardless of body weight. There are other things that may increase negative body image, like overvaluation of um, one's appearance. So even using things like Likert scales, you can help a person to determine uh, how important their body in their their body appearance is to them, and then maybe evaluate you know whether that is the level of importance that they want to apply to the way that they look. So there really are some practical ways that clients can do that work separately. Um, and sometimes that means taking a break from intentional weight loss if they've realized, hey, it's really hard for me to work on intentional weight loss and also work on my body image at the same time. Like maybe I do this and then I do that later if I feel like it's still important to me. Um, but, but you know, having a conversation about the relationship between body image and body appearance to, so that, you know, again, the client is informed. And I just always like to ask, like, hey, can I give you some information um, about body image? And they're like, sure. And I say, well, you know, it's, it's actually not super tightly correlated with the way that we look. And, and, you know, so what do you think about doing X, Y, and Z? And, you know, if then they're, if they're interested in that, you can absolutely integrate that, um, you know, into journaling and things like that. So you actually, you posted a quote from a podcast that you did on the Revive Stronger podcast. You did that today about how your, your, can, your body can change without improving your body image and you can improve your body image without changing your body. And I think that that's such a good point because, you know, if you have someone who's maybe 200 pounds and they want to get down to that 140, if you were to snap your finger and they were in that 140, you know, body they may not be happy with themselves and they, that's what they thought that they wanted and thought would that would bring them happy. But normally what Marissa and I find with our clients, it's a process of getting to that 140. It was the, the hard work, the overcoming hard, the, the obstacles and everything that they had to change about their lifestyle. And that's what they're most happy with. It's not that they hit the 140 or they're in their quote unquote, you know, goal body. It's everything that led up to that experience. So I think that that's just such a good quote and a huge takeaway for people that it's not getting to that goal number or that you're finally going to be happy. It's, it's the internal work that you have to do to eventually get there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. This kind of makes me think of one client in particular that I've worked with and, um, you know, her story is, is kind of similar to everything we've been talking about. She worked with me for a couple months on intentional weight loss first, because when, when people come in, that's usually what they say that they want to do. And that's just kind of the reality of being a nutrition and fitness coach. That's, that's what people, they want to tone up. They want to get fit. They want to lean out. Um, and that's like my reality of, of, I guess, the message that I have attracted up until this point. Um, so, so we worked on that. She lost a good amount of weight uh, in that time frame, And then, you know, she felt empowered to try this on her own. And that is a part of my message of coaching is I want you to be autonomous. And I want you to take these skills and these habits and take them for the rest of your life and be able to feel confident doing that. Um, but, you know, as we know, without the accountability, that doesn't always work. So she, uh, she I guess, fell off the wagon a little bit came back uh, after uh, I think maybe six months or so and her body image, uh, her you know self-confidence was in a, in a bad place after having regained that weight and kind of lost those habits or the sense of control over those habits. And, and so we spent the next, I don't know, year working on just like, let's not focus on weight loss. Let's not track a macro. Let's focus on using what I like to call the rule of threes with, with our meals and just, you know, fueling our body with stuff that makes us feel really good and not focusing on the scale weight, not even weighing ourselves and just getting really good and comfortable with the resistance training. Mm -hmm. And she was able to work with a barbell through all of 2020 because uh, she lucked out. Her brother has a little setup in his garage. So over the past year, she has absolutely transformed. And now the dialogue sounds like lifting brings me so much joy. My daily routine brings me so much joy. I feel so happy with what I've accomplished this year and the growth that I've made internally and externally. And now she feels comfortable saying, 
hey, I feel good about, you know, kind of, kind of working on intentional weight loss. Now I feel ready. I feel like I'm in a sound place mentally and physically where this is something I want to try again, because that's still something that is important to me. And that journey for her, I mean, that it's been one of the most like near and dear to my heart, I have to say, uh, because stuff like that, uh, you know, you don't come across that very often. And, and those relationships are so important. Um, and I wanted to uh, kind of touch on as well, what you said about giving, uh, getting consent for giving information, because I think that's so important because our reflex is to teach our reflex here, sitting here. We love to teach. We love to tell people, you know, what, it, why, why we're doing what we're doing and all the science behind it and all the information, but you know, we've learned over time and Christina and I have talked about this at length, like when someone at work or, you know, one of your friends asks you like, oh, like, why are you eating that for your competition prep? Or, uh, you know, how do you track a macro? Typically they don't really want like the answer that you want to give them. They just kind of want like that quick, like, yes, uh, intermittent fasting works answer <laughs> or something like that. Right. And, and so over time we've learned like we, they, people don't really want that long answer that we want to give unless they're really asking for it. So like you said, you know, they're going to seek out that information when you put them in an environment where they feel comfortable doing so. And they're actually curious to learn it. Um, and so when it comes to coaching, I kind of find the same thing and these, you know, the relationships develop to where eventually people do get curious. They want to know more and they want to get to that, that deep level. But when I first start with someone, I think that's probably the biggest turnoff as a, like as a client to ask a question and, you know, get all this information that they didn't really ask for. They just wanted to know, you know, what was going to apply to them in that moment, in that exact context. Right. And so, um, I think, you know, does that, do you think that that creates barriers to behavior change? Or I guess I kind of want to segue that into, you know, achieving behavior change and, and how we help clients do that as coaches, or you know, even just applications for people listening without a coach who are looking for information and resources to make that change. Absolutely. Yeah. I, it's, um, it's about delivering the information sort of at the right time for them. Um, one, one way of stating it that I think is really useful and accessible is that our expertise supplements their journey. So they have unique expertise on themselves. They know what their preferences are. They know what's realistic for them. They know what they would enjoy and what's sustainable. And then we as coaches and practitioners have expertise in our area of study. So when I'm engaging with a client, the first step is really that building of rapport, that I'm not giving them any information, that I'm just asking them for more information. I need to learn about their world. And so I'm asking them open-ended questions to determine um, their, their foundational knowledge and their experiences, their current relationship with their food and their body. They're telling me about where they feel stuck, what their obstacles are what their strengths are, what they want to change, and why that change is important to them. Once we've narrowed down some realistic changes that they'd like to make, that's when planning can start. And planning is really when I'm providing information. And I'm doing that with a method um, also from MI, it's called the elicit provide elicit method. Um, so I elicit their permission. So they say, okay, I want to, you know, I want to figure out a way to kind of keep track of my food intake, but I don't want to have to track macros all the time. And I say, okay, well, can I tell you about a few different options that are not really macro tracking, but they're sort of structured and organized. And they're like, yeah. And then I tell them, well, there's plate planning. Um, there's the hunger scale and there's a couple other options and here's how they look. What do you think of those? So I've provided the information then I elicit what they think. The key is that they choose their solution. Where we often fall short and what can really break down a dynamic is when a client comes to us with a problem and we put on our expert hat and we go into fix it mode and they say, oh man, you know, it's just, I have a hard time getting veggies in. And we're like, oh, well, you should try canned veggies. It's like so easy, you can just take it with you. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, that actually does make sense. Makes sense 
but it's not a realistic and applicable approach for them. And so they find that even though it's something that makes sense and something they would like to do, there's enough friction between them and that habit that they don't do it. And then they come back to you and you say, well, how did the veggie thing go? And you're like, well, I kind of fell off. It was hard to, to bring the cans and I forgot. And you're like, oh gosh, well, that's okay. Um, but you know, let's try frozen veggies next time. And the, the cycle repeats itself. And so you get a reduction in self-efficacy on the side of the client um, and more reliance on you as the practitioner. And while it gives us a great deal of job security, um, it really doesn't set the clients up for long, long-term success. Now, of course, there are people who will really benefit from a more directive approach. If they're like, I don't know how much, how many veggies I'm supposed to eat. Um, I don't even know what a vegetable is. Like, what's an example of a starch? And you're like, oh, okay, well, I can give you some examples of that. Like this and this and this. It's generally recommended that you get like three to five servings of veggies per day. And they're like, okay, but you can still involve them. You can still say, what are some veggies that you would like to have? And they're like this, this, and this. So when I'm helping a client plan, I'm, even though I know that there is an intrinsic um, agreement that I will be providing them with information, I don't, my first step is not to, let me give you all the information. Let me give you a solution. It's to um, ask, do you want this information? Because maybe they're like, no, I don't wanna know about that. You know, there are, and, and that's where the writing reflex can really steer us wrong also. When we wanna help, and I've, I've done this in the past, Last year, the beginning of last year, um, I got, really did get into sort of trying to be like fix it mode. And when clients came to me, because I was starting to get um, a group of clients that wanted to move away from macro tracking, and they came to me and I saw that they were struggling, I wanted to immediately relieve them of their struggle. I wanted to say like, here's, here's what I think you should, here's the approach I think you should take. Um, you know, it really seems like intentional weight loss is, is damaging you and that's something that you should stop. And so even in the way that I was questioning and reflecting back to them, it was not with the most sincere curiosity and openness to whatever they would, were going to decide. I still wanted them to decide to do a specific thing. And I've been able to move away from that now so that if I have a person that comes to me and they are struggling and they don't really want to keep losing weight, but they are keep counting macros, um, but they don't feel ready to stop counting macros, I don't guide them in a pushing or pulling way. I just ask, what's what's the next step that you feel like you could take? Um, so that's really, I think, um, you know, from what I've seen anecdotally and then based also on the literature. I mean, when we're looking at the efficacy of MI in many different forms of behavior change and looking at behavior change theory, that there always is a focus on autonomy. Um, so that's a person's own, um, I don't wanna use the term control, but they have charge over their own decisions. They're making the choice. And um, you know, a sense of self-efficacy or capability that they know that they can do this thing. And so that's why we, we have them come up with a solution and give them some helpful um, prompts. Like imagine that it's your worst day. It's your absolute busiest day. What's gonna be realistic for you on your busiest day or your busiest week? And what would success look like to you on that day? So we also expand our idea of what success looks like. We expand our repertoire of habits we may have weekday habits and then we have weekend habits. And guess what? That's okay. We don't have to have the exact same set of habits every day. It just has to be kind of like a net average of consistency over time. Um, so that is kind of like the, that's the more like practical approach to helping people make change, providing information in a client-centered way and, um, and equipping them with, with our expertise, but applied to the backdrop of their expertise. I generally try to give people like three different options if they're kind of making a decision and also normalizing the ambivalence of wanting two things that are at odds. You know, I have, I think um, it, it, there was an interaction that I had, excuse me, with a client recently who, um, you know, I probably at reflecting, I should have done a better job of ensuring that we had the same expectations, but they said, you know, they, they were looking for 
a lot of um, kind of what they called accountability. And they said, you know, they, they, they wanted to be really healthy, but they wanted to, you know, eat what they said were called junk food. And, um, you know, they wanted a coach that was going to inspire them. And I thought, you know, this person wants a coach who will help them want to do the things they want to do and to not want to do the things they don't want to do. But in the moment, we want to eat the, the tasty foods. Um, but we also want these other things. And we believe that those might be at odds. Um, so I, I think that's what I try to get to is, you know, helping people, yeah, figure out what they want and then help them do that in the safest way. Um, but then, you know, normalizing that sometimes we want two things that are at odds and it doesn't mean that we lack willpower or self-control. It's completely normal and a human experience to say, I want this thing and I also want this other thing. And there are tools that we can provide to our clients um, to help them weigh the pros and cons and make a decision that is aligned with their values. Um, and hopefully their goals are aligned with their values as well. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I think, you know, this takes constant like checking on ourselves as coaches because um, it's, it's something that I catch myself doing on calls and in my, so, you know, you mentioned uh, tone of voice in email. So I, I think me and Christina both use video responses. So we're always talking to, and they're seeing us, you know, express ourselves in this way. Um, so it is a little bit more, um, I guess, easier to not have things lost in translation in that way. But, you know, even when I'm asking questions on those videos or in on Zoom calls, um, you know, I, I want to say one thing that directs the client to what, what I think will be best for them. And then I'm like, hold on, hold on, just like wait like one second, ask it open-ended. Like just, just ask it in a way that is non-biased, that is open-ended, see what they have to say about it. And that is something that I'm constantly, um, in all honesty, just getting better at. And I don't think I'm perfect with it. Um, and I think that's important to acknowledge as well for my clients listening. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, that's something that that's difficult because we want to keep wearing that expert hat and say, well, I know what's best for you and I know what's worked for me and you hired me. So that means that you think that what I think is best for you is best for you. But, you know, I think helping those people come to their, their own conclusions is, is so, so important. And the more that I practice this, the more that I ask those open-ended questions, the more that I realize that, you know, I have so much to learn when, when I'm guiding people and oftentimes what I think is going to be best for someone doesn't end up being that way. And so once we figure out, okay, well, you just told me that what you want is completely different than what we've kind of been on a track towards uh, for a while now, you know, then, you know, I'm, I'm adapting and learning how to better serve this person. Um, and I think it's really important to speak to the people listening because uh, they're not all just Christina and I's clients, even though I do think they, they do make up some of our listener base. <laughs> um, but we have a lot of people who don't have coaches um, or have never hired a coach. Um, and so to kind of summarize what you were saying earlier, I think it's very important for someone when they have a goal, let's say it's intentional weight loss or uh, you know just behavior change towards healthier habits, um, to reflect on themselves as if they were being most motivationally interviewed, um, you know, reflecting, asking themselves the reasons why, why is something important to you? Uh, where do you feel stuck? What are your barriers to entry? Um, and, and why is, is this valuable to you? And why do you desire this outcome? Um, and so if you are listening to this and you, you don't have that sounding board of a coach to talk to, and it's not something that you can afford or want to do or want to invest in, these are questions that you can ask yourself um, and take away from this episode, you know, without having to, to outsource um, in that kind of way and, and just be a resource to yourself. And, and maybe that takes self-reflection. Maybe you journal that out instead of talking to someone about it. Um, but those are the, I think, the questions that we can definitely be asking ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Once we identify our values, those are the, the traits, the characteristics, the people, um, uh, that are important to us, it becomes a little bit easier to make decisions about what we want to do and prioritize those things. Um, and we may find that the goals that we had set out for ourselves 
and the way that we uh, live our days are not necessarily aligned with our values. So one um, kind of thought experiment that I do with folks is I ask them to describe their ideal day. Uh, and it has to be, a, it's a realistic day. We haven't like won the lottery and, you know, we're living in, in Tahiti or something. It's a realistic ideal day right now with your family, with your career. Um, but it's something that is different unless what you're doing right now is ideal. That's awesome. But if what you're doing right now is not ideal, it's the realistic ideal, the way you would spend your day. What I find is that most people when they're describing their day and they're describing their meal experiences, they are not talking about the way they look. They're talking about spending a different amount of time with their family and friends and their, and their kids um, than they are right now. They're talking about uh, working realistically less than they are now. They're talking about enjoying uh, the, whatever movement they choose to do. And they're talking about enjoying their experiences with food. And they're not saying that they never eat another donut or that they eat vegetables with every meal um, or that they're eating a certain amount. They're, they're saying that they are eating um, food and it is, tastes good and it feels like it's in an amount that's comfortable for them and they're eating a wide variety of foods. And that yes, they're eating a lot of vegetables and things like that that are very health promoting, but that they're also including foods that just taste good, but they enjoy them, they don't feel guilty, they don't feel shame, and they feel that they can stop eating them when they want to. So it's about finding a place of balance. That's where most people are headed. And that's what even people who are um, pursuing intentional weight loss, it's again about what they have attached to the idea of weight loss, that they feel like it, they'll help, it'll help them to regain maybe a sense of control and agency um, in other areas of their body, in other areas of life, rather, rather you know, not just their body, um, and that they'll feel more confident, they'll feel more capable. So like you had mentioned, you know, it's about the process of getting there. They, need, they want to know that they can get there, um, both in part because the process of getting there helps them feel that they have some control over things. And they usually feel better physically too when they're moving their bodies and eating foods that aren't so heavy. Um, and then when they've gotten there, um, they maybe you know ahead of time have a belief that they'll feel sort of differently about their bodies. And sometimes they do, but sometimes, sometimes they don't. Um, so kind of forecasting and imagining that day helps people to identify the disparities between where they are now and where they want to be. And then also what's important to them. You know, if you want to spend more time with your family, then family is probably a value to you. If you want to feel um, you know, more confident, okay, confidence is a value. Health might be a value. And then what's the next reasonable step you could take toward that life? And sometimes people say, oh, I'm going to stop working at a specific time. Uh, I'm going to start eating vegetables with dinner every week. You know, so we start with something that is very realistic and achievable, even on your toughest day. Because the idea there is that the more that you can um, prove to yourself that you're capable of these steps, the greater self-efficacy you have. So the greater confidence, kind of a situational self-confidence. I can do this thing. I can probably do this other thing. I had a client come up with a term that I thought was really excellent um, because we started with uh, plate planning and over time, she was curious. She wanted to count um, just fat macros uh, initially um, because um, of just some GI distress stuff. And then said, I want to learn more and more. And she said, I feel like we've opened capacity doors because I focus on one skill. And once I practice that and I feel very confident with that skill, I'm ready for something that's, that's more complex. So greater self-efficacy means greater task difficulty. It means we can have this stepwise approach to learning about more things. And I have so many more tools in my toolbox now. I'm not beholden to counting macros, but I can do it if I want to. I know that that's a tool that I can use. And so we move in that direction over time. Um, and that's something that you could do you know, independently, you know, even if you're not working with a, with a coach, it's just keep in mind, what is your craziest day? Is this still realistic for you? Um, and then, you know, when we're working with folks, realizing that there are some really legitimate barriers to entry for people, you know, like it is um, a barrier to entry to, to not be able to have access to a coach, to 
not have access to fruits and vegetables. So keeping those things in mind as well, um, that it's not going to be, you know, it's, it's not an equitable uh, health environment at the moment. I love the idea of the capacity doors and, and how, I think again, like Marissa was saying, and if you don't have access to a coach, if you don't work with one at the moment, that weight loss, intentional weight loss, if that's something that you wanna do or habit change, it can seem very overwhelming that there's so much information. There's so much that you can focus on. And, you know, we touched on gut health and, you know, your gut microbiome and it's like, wow, that's, you know, but I don't even know what a macro is. So instead of trying to focus on these you know, everything, try to get a very good foundation first and focus on that. And once that becomes something that you can do on your hard days, um, and then you can open up the door to, to learning something new and focusing and continuing to build on what you've already achieved and what you can do on a normal day to day. So I think that's a really, really good term that they used. Oh, yeah. I think, you know, to add on to that, um, you know, I really like the describe your ideal day um, kind of strategy because then we we can literally pinpoint, okay, well, how is this different than, you know, than the day that you want to be living that is, you know, realistic to you. And so, you know, that could be um, the foods that you're choosing to eat or, you know, resorting to out of, you know, just kind of having to grab something and go, whereas, you know, the other situation, maybe you're, you're planning your meals and you're feeling good about what you choose to eat. Um, and I think that we can take these like stepwise approaches when we have the, the start and the finish kind of laid out in a way that, you know, we're looking at what do we really want out, out of this lifestyle? And I, I know Christina and I both really like to emphasize focusing on like one main thing at a time. And, you know, that opening the capacity doors is a perfect example of that. And I think there was, it was an analogy used on a podcast talking about injury, but it just made me think about it. And it was a sink and a drain capacity. So if you're running the faucet, but the drain is not draining as quickly as you're pouring water into it, then you can quickly become overwhelmed and overflowed. Um, and that's kind of the same thing with like the information overload that that's coming to you when you're trying to adopt these new habits, create this new lifestyle, uh, or make changes to what you're doing. But when you are opening up one door at a time, or you are, uh, you know, matching your ability to drain that water out with the how much you're actually pouring in, how much effort are you putting forth towards making a change? And how, how quickly can you actually adapt to that and accept that change, I think is really important to focus on um, and, and taking things at your own pace and really focusing on things uh, uh, one at a time. So instead of doing a total overhaul and saying, I'm going to now drink a gallon of water a day from, you know, one cup per day, or like only drinking diet soda, um, to, you know, that and working out every day and, you know, doing, you know, having five servings of vegetables a day instead, like, okay, like you said, let's have vegetables at dinner and let's just try that for a week and see how it goes. And oftentimes what we find is when you put that singular focus, and I, I think I, I've seen this a lot anecdotally, is when you focus on one thing and you achieve that, you feel good about the fact that you were able to accomplish that. You're building the self-efficacy and it just encourages further change. And usually the process happens a lot quicker than if you were to take it from that top-down approach of, okay, let's make all these changes at once. And then, you know, your client comes back to you reporting that they were only able to do one thing, even though you put all of these things on their plate, the outcome is the same. They changed one thing, but the perception is, you know, I feel like a failure versus I feel like a success. And I think that that is so crucial to being able to make that change. Yeah, absolutely. And shifting away from sort of like the absolutist mindset also of like, it's 100% or it's 0%. You know, I did it all or I did nothing. Um, that has been hugely helpful for all of the clients that I worked with that were kind of battling with that. You know, it's sort of like this, the perfectionist analysis paralysis trap um, of it has to be ideal, it has to be uh, optimal and perfect. And if it's not, then there's no point, you know? So it's, if I can't go to the gym for 45 minutes, I'm not gonna go at all. Or, um, you know, we see that also with <clears throat> sort of like the last 
supper effect. Like a person eats something, you know, if they do have a rigid, um, uh, a rigid dietary restraint approach and they eat one thing that sort of breaks a food rule, then they will often have an, uh, you know, an overconsumption episode of that food, sort of like, okay, diet starts tomorrow. I have to set, I have to reset. And, you know, this was a failure. Um, so that has helped in the maintenance and sort of the consistency of, of habituation that when people take more of an iterative mindset, so they are looking at, oh, that, that didn't go as I had anticipated. Um, what was the obstacle? What was the friction on this day? Oh, it was a scheduling thing or, or you know, it was a different environment. Okay, next time I'm gonna do this other thing. So that's one thing that I've really encouraged in my clients is you know, um, reflecting on like how the past couple of days have gone and why it happened like that. And then what might we do differently next time? What's realistic next time? And that's even how we came up with like the idea of weekday habits versus weekend habits. So it's not a, oh, I fell off the wagon this weekend, or I was, you know, I didn't stick to my stuff this weekend. It's the weekend is an entirely different set of habits because it's a different environment and a different schedule. And that is totally fine. And then the weekday, it's different again. And so having that, again, expansive idea of success, and then this kind of exploratory um, learning process, it's not a pass fail. It's, um, and it's even something that, you know, when I'm, <clears throat> one of the skills of MI is reflecting to a client. And so sometimes a client will tell me about, often they'll tell me about themselves, and they might say things that um, they perceive as, as flaws. And, um, you know, so it might be a common example is, you know, I feel like I've tried every diet under the sun and I just can't stick to anything. And when I am giving that information back to a client, I want to emphasize their strengths. And so the strength that I interpret from that is I um, am open to trying a lot of new things. Or I want to, I want to be diligent. I want to be deliberate in my decision making. I want to know that I'm doing the right thing. So I say, oh, you, you're a very deliberate person um, or you're a very curious person. And so we can do that for ourselves too, that instead of saying like, oh, this weekend, man, I didn't do this and didn't do this. It's, oh, you know what? I was really prioritizing time with my friends and my family. I was really present with them. And I, and I didn't pay as much attention to my eating at the time. And then afterwards I realized I was really full because I was just so engaged. You know, I was really laughing at my uncle's jokes so when we reflect on ourselves with kindness and compassion, even though a lot of people think like, oh no, if I do that, I, I'll never want to change. Um, if you've ever worked with a boss that has been like really cruel to you and just like, I, can I swear on this podcast? Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> and it's like, on you a lot, that does not encourage or evoke change and like, you know, uh, an internal motivation to get stuff done. And it really doesn't work with, with ourselves either. You know, when our self-talk is really critical, um, that does not been shown to be effective for, for maintaining, uh, initiating or maintaining behavior change. And so if we can reflect um, with kindness to ourselves and just learn from whatever happened, that's probably gonna be much more effective long-term. Um, than, you know, beating ourselves up and looking at it like I didn't do all this stuff that I wanted to do. Um, I'm like, you know, if you did two, you know, or like two out of 10 things you want to do, it's a 20%, you know, not a minus 80%. I think, yeah, I think you bring up such a good point. And it's the same thing. It's like, if you were working with a coach, you don't want to use fear or like I'm the authority and you didn't do this. So you disappointed me or so again, I feel like you have a, a counseling or a therapy background because you talk about, you know, the motivational interviewing and having a client centered approach and all of these tactics that you use to elicit behavior change. And I think it's just so great. And I, I love that you keep coming back to the, the client centered and focusing on the positives rather than just, you know, I'm the authority, you have to do what I say. And if you didn't do it, you failed this week. Mm -hmm. So I just, I love all the points that you bring up and I'm pretty sure you could be a counselor or a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have, it's on the docket to, to get my master's in health psych. It's just, uh, you know, I have to one thing at a time, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think it's, I, I wish that I knew then what I know now, you know, when I was teaching and I was doing 
um, the academic version of motivational interviewing, um, which is appreciative advising. And that's where that the um, question, you know, what do you do in your free time? And that's where that comes from, that it, you help students find their own solutions and build um, you know, sort of their own like roadmap to, to graduation, although it's a little bit more um, directed because sometimes it's a little bit complex to navigate, you know, a uh, curriculum. Yeah. But um, that's kind of, that was the foundation for it, I think, you know, when, and, I, and seeing too that the authoritative approach doesn't, wasn't helpful with students. I didn't ever want to have an adversarial dynamic with them, um, which can be more challenging in an academic environment because that kind of exists. Sometimes they come in and they're like, there is a hierarchy that already exists. So I already, I think, was biased toward that type, that type of approach when I was still teaching. Um, and then when I was, when I was coaching, I, um, so I have a health coach certification and they actually talk a lot about cognitive behavioral coaching, um, motivational interviewing and, um, and Socratic questioning and things like that. So, so there was already sort of that client-centered focus. And then I went on to um, complete a motivational interviewing course mm -hmm. um, that actually uh, Bill Miller, Bill, Bill Miller, Steve Rolnick, and Teresa Moyers put that on. It was just, I mean, it was like in the next level, you know, I thought like, oh wow, you know, these are this is what was really missing. Um, and I was so excited to, you know, apply that. Um, and and I think that it is really helped change my dynamic with, with clients in really positive ways. Yeah, that's so awesome. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so when we talk about, I think we ended off that last little bit on being kind to ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is a great way to transition into introducing, okay, what is the Hayes movement? I wanted to really shed some light on this because I think a lot of people have heard of it. I think it relates so much to everything we're talking about. Um, and they really do go hand in hand, like you said, uh, when we were kind of planning this and emailing back and forth. Um, and so Hayes is, is health at every size. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are a lot of misconceptions around it. I think people think that it is a way to promote obesity and to promote unhealthy habits. I think that's the surface level. Uh, media portrayal of what this is, but you have been uh, a spearhead in in shedding light on this kind of, you know, what it actually is and, and clearing up why this is actually such a positive movement. Um, and I, I did not know this at all until I found your content. Um, I actually was under the impression that it was a negative thing. So um, you were actually the one that, that flipped my perspective on this. So tell us what, what is Hayes and, uh, you know, what are the misconceptions around it? Well, I'm, I'm really, that, that like makes my day to hear that. Um, not that I'm out to change people's minds. I, I don't think that's something that we can do to a mind that is not primed to change already, you know? Um, but to know that uh, people's minds can be changed and that my information, I put it out there really to um, evoke thought and, and, and conversation and have an open dialogue. Um, and so if you or, or, you know, listeners have, or would like to, you know, see some of the conversations, um, I have some highlights on my um, IG page that I, where I just asked some questions and um, they are, uh, some of the responses are difficult to read because they're questions about what people think about people with obesity or fat people. Um, and I use both terms or people with fat because there's not yet one like agreed upon term for, um, you know, because it's not like they're not, it's not, it's all individuals, not one model. Of group. Um, but in any case, so it was, it was questions about um, how people perceive people in large bodies or weight gain or comparing um, the risks associated with obesity to the risks associated with pee use, so with steroid use, um, and what people think about it being a choice. What I found was really interesting was that um, when people were comparing 
you know, that, that because some people believe that obesity is a choice. When people were comparing what they perceived as the choice to uh, be obese or the choice to use uh, steroids, uh, they, they acknowledged that steroids came with health risks that are pretty much the same as what we would associate with a large body, um, dyslipidemia, uh, uh, metabolic dysregulation, insulin resistance, and things like that, that um, they believe that steroids had a purpose. So that was like an intentional choice and that one's body weight increasing is the result of wrong choices. That it isn't, it's unintentional, but it's still choice-based. None of that is scientific, but it was a really interesting um, like sneak peek into you know, what people, how people actually perceived those two different, but kind of like health-wise maybe overlapping choices. And it was very different from what I had seen in the previous question uh, series where people thought that, oh, that uh, be, be, like weight gain and whatnot was um, not on purpose. It was an accident. It was still a choice, but it was like not on purpose. And that made it not okay. And like peed use is on purpose, so it's okay. So it's basically, it came down to like what people thought was on purpose or not. It didn't matter. The health, the health outcomes didn't matter. They didn't care that if you use steroids, it will potentially send you to the hospital. They didn't care when like looking at the medical costs um, are actually quite similar. Uh, they, it's, it doesn't seem to me, and I don't wanna use all people, but a lot of people that were answering did not seem to care about the health out outcomes. They cared about what they thought was the character flaw that led someone to weight gain. And that was really an embodiment of weight stigma and fat phobia. Think about one of the, you know, the, the, one of the hottest topics of conversation during a global pandemic. So, so during COVID, people are still talking about like their fears around gaining weight, around gaining like, you know, what they call it, like a COVID-19. That is a significant fear that amount of weight may not be associated with uh, loss of health. If someone weighs, if someone is within a normative weight range and then they gain 10 pounds and they're still within a normative weight range, it's not necessarily a risk to their health. So then we start to question, is it about health? Is it about health risk? You know, is all weight loss intrinsically healthy? No. Is all weight gain intrinsically unhealthy? No. Is every person healthy? No. Can we look at, can we tell that by looking at their external appearance? No, I think most people would agree with all of those statements. Um, and and we, we saw this same sort of like preoccupation with dieting, even because I've gotten into the history of it, even during the great depression, like people were starving, almost half of the nation was unemployed or about a third of the nation was unemployed. Um, but the preoccupation with dieting that started in the early 1900s with food conservation and changing percep perceptions of body weight, that really lasted. So today, what we have um, is are, are a lot, I think, a lot of beliefs about what weight gain and body size mean, what they say about a person's character. And these are so deeply entrenched that it's understandable that people would feel uncomfortable or doubtful about um, messages that would contradict that. So health at every size does not posit that people are healthy at every size, but it doesn't pathologize based solely on body weight. We don't wanna make it like, you know, uh, <laughs> guilty before being proven innocent. It's sort of like that. It's that we, we, I think it's a reasonable statement to say, you can't necessarily judge a person's health based on their external appearance. Some people believe that being in a large body is intrinsically unhealthy, regardless of the person's biomarkers, because there is an associated increased risk of eventually developing an obesity associated disease. So, 
to some people, increased risk is the same as already unhealthy. So I think that's one of the contentious topics there is, you know, what, you know, does, can this actually be healthy? So like the Cosmopolitan art, uh, magazine that said, this is healthy, this is healthy, this is healthy. You know, people are like, that can't be healthy. So, so that's one of the big misconceptions. It's not that we're saying that every body size is healthy. It's that we can't determine it based on external appearance. And it could be that that person is healthy in that moment. We're not trying to make predictions about what's going on, um, but also that it's okay if that person is not healthy at this moment. This is another contentious topic. If a person is not healthy, do they have a moral obligation to pursue health? Some people say yes, and I think it also depends on like the society and the healthcare system. Some people say no, one person's health is not your business because it's their health. Where we, see dis where we see disagreement about that is, okay, well, am I paying for that person's medical care? It's expensive to be sick. If we assume that a person in a large body is going to be sick, then I'm paying for that. Um, so those are the two kind of things I think people get caught up on a lot. Hayes is really a, uh, a social, it is, it is an approach, and it's also part of a social justice movement to increase access to and information about resources to support health and well being. So, if a person chooses to pursue health, that they can do so. We make it a more equitable place to pursue health so that if a person is in a very large body, they have equal access to exercise clothing that we uh, can give them equal access to machines that would fit them, that they would be able to get into and out of comfortably. Um, that maybe we look at the way that the built environment is affecting their ability to get outside and go for a walk. So it is about sharing the responsibility for health because one of the theories um, put forth in the, in the early 1980s was that um, perhaps personal responsibility is so great a focus now that it's serving as a surrogate for institutional change. So basically we say health healthism is the moralization of health. And it's also the belief that people have a duty to overcome whatever obstacles might be facing them to pursue health and to ensure that they um, remain healthy. That's sort of their duty as a biological citizen. So that's part of it is to share that responsibility to say, yes, we can have personal responsibility. A person can say, I'm responsible for my health and I want to, to do something about it. And that I want to have access to the resources to do something about it. The other things that it addresses are respectful care. So addressing the impact of weight stigma in people who are in larger bodies and those are both psychological and, phys and, and physiological effects. So weight stigma can actually drive obesogenic processes. So it may uh, lead people to uh, overeat, to binge eat. Um, they may have uh, elevated blood pressure when they're in the doctor's office because they're nervous. They may not get the same care that a person in a normative body would get. And then perhaps uh, real illnesses could be overlooked because doctors are saying, I think you need to lose weight. Um, so respectful care is a big one. Um, joyful movement, an enjoyable movement. So encouraging people to move in a way that they find to be enjoyable and not as a way to earn their calories or to burn them off, but because it, it feels good to them to move their body in some way. And that they also focus on uh, eating for well-being. So it doesn't have to be macros, it doesn't have to be something that's weighed and tracked. It's not about calories in versus calories out. It's about finding foods that are satisfying and uh, health promoting, um, but also we're thinking about an entire dietary pattern, you know, and not judging people for what they're eating ever, but you know, certainly not for their body size. So it's really a, a movement about ensuring that human beings are receiving respectful care, respect from other human beings around them, 
access to health promoting resources if they so choose to use them and the autonomy and respect if they choose not to do them. Because let's be real, a lot of people are making choices that are perhaps not super healthy for themselves or for the environment. And some of these choices have, have been deemed to be more acceptable than others. And so I think that it's really probably like an okay practice to say that, um, you know, yes, we can have some shared responsibility, but perhaps there also need to be some institutional changes made so that people can have a more equitable access to whatever those resources are. And that there's really not a great body of literature to show that like shaming people is an effective means of inspiring or encouraging change. So Hayes is not about everyone's healthy at every size and it's not promoting obesity. It's not promoting any one body type. It is. It looks like promoting because we're very used to seeing a certain size body and then when we see a large body and people say this is healthy, uh, that looks like promoting because it's, it seems like we're talking about something that is unusual or rare maybe. Now I do wanna say one thing about Cosmo that while I really think it's great to say like this could be healthy, it's maybe not super effective to take any person and label this is healthy regardless of bodies. It, like it's kind of the same flavor, you know but in two different directions. And maybe we say, we don't know if this person is healthy because we haven't seen their biomarkers and we don't know anything about their mental health, but this is a human that's deserving of respect. And so let's give them that first. And then we can say, if they're not healthy, let's also make that okay. And then tell them, if you would like to get healthy, here are some resources to do that. And if not, you're an autonomous human. And me shaming you or telling you what to do isn't going to help. I don't like it when people do that to me, so I'm not going to do that. And they'll leave it. <laughs> well, I think going back to the, the Cosmo cover, it's, you know, if you have the typical or, you know, maybe not Cosmo or some other uh, health magazine and you have a, a fitness model who's on the cover and they have a six pack and everyone looks at that and thinks that is the epitome of health. And, and that's someone who's healthy. But again, you don't know their biomarkers. You don't know what they did to achieve that level of leanness and, you know, what the mental battles that they have. But as a society, we're generally more accepting of that person and we equate that body to health. So I think it's just, it's such a good thing to think about it and people have these stigmas, when you look at that, the Cosmo cover that everyone has been talking about recently, you automatically think that's not healthy. Yeah. That, that, and so I think it's, it's trying to debunk the, the myth of when, if you look at someone, you can automatically determine whether or not they're healthy or not. Yeah. You know, oh or, yeah, yeah. Or about their character. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's another thing that people make assumptions on. Mm -hmm. And I, Oh my gosh. So I just learned so much more about Hayes than I thought I knew. Um, so thank you for that. Um, it's not just, you know, I think uh, to kind of summarize, you know, it's not just being kind to yourself um, and, you know, knowing that you have these choices, but also about that kindness to others, that respect for others. Um, and I really love what you said about health at every size is not equal to healthy at every size. So, you know, we're acknowledging that, you know, being obese does come with certain health risks and someone's biomarker profile might show that they are unhealthy um, or maybe someone's mental health is, is down the drain. Um, and so we can't just, you know, label that. Uh, but I think, so I work uh, part-time in the lab, the smart lab at Mason. Um, so I'm doing me resting metabolic rate testing. I'm doing bod pod testing. I'm doing uh, VO2 max. So people come in all the time to get bod pod scans. They say, well, I want to see my body fat or whatever. And all the time I see people where, you know, and I, I hate that this is, you know, a stigma and something that we automatically jump to, but someone who is in a larger body walks in and they're coming to get their body fat scan. 
And, you know, it's, it's like, at this point in this culture, it's human nature to make those assumptions and say like, oh, this person is, uh, you know, trying to get it together or whatever it might be, you know, these, these assumptions. And then, uh, you know, I come to find out after conversing with this person, and this is something that's kind of changed my mind uh, over time for the better as well. This person's already lost a hundred pounds. This person's already, you know, this person's living an extremely healthy lifestyle. This person works out all the time and they are loving the process. And, you know, I think it's so important that we don't just slap these labels on and we really get to know each person as an individual because you hear those stories and you're like, holy crap, like you work out more than me or, you know, you eat better than I do. And it, it's like, it's just crazy to me that, that, that you know, we have, uh, we're battling, like, like you said, like a cent, almost a century now of this culture that has been perpetuated. Uh, but I think it's really great what you're doing. Um, and I can feel the passion in your voice when you talk about it. Um, you know, how important this is for, for everyone to, to hear this message and to, to understand this at a deeper level, because I think a big part of it is people don't take the time to understand this at a deeper level. And the socioeconomic stuff and the uh, institutional level change, this is the new stuff that I had not heard about. I had heard about Hayes as, you know, a way to provide access to, to you know, better, better healthy habits and, and not judging someone based on their size because you don't know their story. Uh, but it, it kind of ended there. That was my understanding. Um, and so seriously, like that, that was um, just great to hear and, and, and a lot to learn. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot more to it that, that I could definitely take the time to learn. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that because um, I think, yeah, like you said, it's one that maybe people just don't know the whole, you know, they don't have like a, a comprehensive view of like what Hayes is actually about. And also, you know, I think that there are people um, of all of various ideologies that may with good intentions because they want to affect change, um, have discourse with others that's like not, um, that, that might be a little bit too persuasive, you know? And that, and that uh, people are also speaking out against, you know, stigma and prejudice. And when, when they're doing that, and, and for those of us who have existed in, in normative bodies, you know, we can't ever really understand what they've gone through. Uh, and some people are not maybe willing to try to understand or to empathize, you know, that it's understandably very emotional for people and they can be triggered by, by certain things. And, you know, there are passions and things and, and like strong emotions and whatnot. And it's hard to communicate effectively, you know, on Instagram. <laughs> so um, I, I don't think it's, it's not hugely surprising to me that we've been kind of like playing this game of telephone with some of these messages. I mean, it happened with intuitive eating, you know, like intuitive eating became, uh, intuitive eating like capital uh, I, capital E became little I, little E intuitive eating. And that became synonymous with eating intuitively. And that is just synonymous for not tracking macros. And so now you have something that is a weight neutral intervention for folks with binge eating disorder being conflated with an off season bodybuilder who's eyeballing macros. Those are not even in the same ballpark. And then when you're looking at, at actual like intuitive eating through the lens of, but I have to hit my macros. And then you ask a question, well, can we do intuitive eating in an obesogenic food environment? The real question is, can we do intuitive eating in an obesogenic food environment and hit our macros correctly and not gain weight? That's the real question. It's not asking about the utility of intuitive eating as an intervention to help people stop chronic dieting. It's, can I do intuitive eating, um, but prevent weight gain? And the, that or the answer to that is it's weight neutral. So we can't make any statements about what's gonna happen with intuitive, intuitive eating. So it's things like that. Like those are the topics that's where, so it's almost like it's a symptom of these deep seated beliefs um, and, and this sort of, you know, it's a, I call it a dieting culture. And I don't mean like diet culture that, you know, some 
is used in other ways. Right? Like a culture of dieting, sort of like a belief system about intentional weight loss and weight control. So this is like a bad thing. But when we are viewing haze and we're viewing intentional eating and weight neutral approaches through that lens, the questions that we're answering, an the questions that we're asking um, that come out of our mouths are not the whole question quite often. There's something else to it. And the fear about weight gain is quite often preventing people from taking a weight neutral approach and moving away from macros because there's so much stigma attached to weight gain, even in a person with a normative body. You know, it doesn't, we don't, we're not always talking about people uh, with large bodies. We're talking also about men and women who have not existed like that and are afraid of gaining 10 pounds. And so they, they are afraid of not tracking. So it's affecting all of us in some way. Um, and, and it's just, I think it's worth, I think it's worth unpacking. I think it's worth talking about. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think too, uh, your, your final points on, on Hayes, I think it really comes, I, you drew it really full circle. It really comes down to understanding people as an individual. So when we take a client in, and I will say I have clients that are of normative weight, I have clients that are in larger bodies. Um, and you know, it, it all comes down to, okay, when we sit down for that first conversation, that consult call or that, you know, that call where we set up and we start to talk and, and plan, understanding who that person is and what their life is like, what are their barriers and understanding that someone in a larger body probably is facing a couple more barriers to entry uh, based on stigma and based on uh, all of their experiences that led them up to this point. And like, I like to really start the conversation by saying, you know, thank you for just being here and being open with me. And um, you know, I really hope that I can get to know you and, and we can make this a really productive conversation. Um, and, you know, that could make all the difference, um, seriously. So um, I think that really does bring it kind of full circle to, to behavior change as, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, the, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's a, the paradox is that when you accept yourself, then you can change. You know, acceptance is not like giving up. It's not that you'll never change again. It's just not arguing with the current reality of the way things are. You just accept, okay, this is how things are. Things will change with or without my input. I can probably nudge them in a given direction if I want to. Yeah, give them that information if they're asking for it, right? And give. I think that's so important with informing our clients or informing our listeners. Um, and, you know, when they're open to it, that can help inform their decisions further, but ultimately it's always going to be their decision. And I think returning to that as a coach has been uh, one of the most valuable things that has changed my interactions in my career. And I, I have to say that, you know, starting to listen to, to your content has been a big part of that. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. If I can help you and you help other people, then I feel like that's met my purpose. So I guess what we can do, I feel like you wrapped up Hayes really nicely and we've talked about a lot of, of really good stuff. And Marissa at the beginning of the podcast said this was going to be a good one. And I absolutely think that you did deliver. <laughs> um, so Beyond we expectations. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I feel like we could, we could talk for another couple hours. Um, but to, to kind of summarize, you know, we talked about your, your background, um, you got your PhD from Virginia Tech and you switched around a couple different majors um, and eventually found your, your passion in helping people. And you were a professor for a couple of years and went um, to now being a full-time coach. And, you know, your main overarching goal is to clarify misconceptions and to challenge um, different thought processes that are, that are out there now. And we talked a lot about behavior change and, you know, you as a coach trying to help people decide what they will want to do and how to do it. And you have a lot of different things that you talked about through motivational interviewing and, you know, really getting to know your client and having that client-centered approach um, and how everyone needs kind of that safe space to feel like they have that person who can help them with that behavior change. 
Um, and, you know, we talked about being able to actually achieve behavior change and the capacity doors and um, focus on realistic changing, realistic changes and, you know, trying to have a more positive approach than negative and focusing on the things that you did achieve. Um, and, you know, we talked about the, the Hayes movement and you really brought up a lot of really, really good points about respectful care and have, making sure that everyone has kind of that equal access to, to information and resources. And um, we, again, we have so much good information, um, but if we could, maybe we ask all of our guests if our listeners wanted to make lasting change and they really wanna make living healthy part of their lifestyle, what is that number one tip you would give them? Hmm. Find a strong why and practice self-compassion when things don't go as planned. Ooh, I love that. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. I love, like, you just said one sentence and like, you know, everyone's mind just opened up. Like, <laughs> it's like, oh, there it is. <laughs> oh, I hope so. I hope so. You don't have, you didn't drop a mic, but I feel like you just did. <laughs> I should just, I would pick this up and drop it for you, but <laughs> you really make a lot of noise. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So if people want to find out more about you, they want to listen to maybe some of your, your podcasts or find you on Instagram, where are you on social media? Um, Instagram and Facebook at vitamin PhD. Um, don't have Twitter yet. I'm just, I'm just have too many platforms already. Um, <laughs> but um, vitamin PhD nutrition.com is my website. Um, really, it's just kind of a compendium right now of like podcasts and some educational resources. I also have BTG comprehensive coaching.com. So that's where Shannon and I host all of our coaching um, and bridging the gap specific articles. So they can find um, our collaboration. So the initial bridging the gap series, and then Shannon and I both have a bunch of um, individual articles. And then we also have the comprehensive coaching Facebook community. So that's a membership um, community that we have uh, small but growing. We have about 40 members right now. And we actually have both coaches and clients in that group, which is really cool. We're trying to kind of, uh, you know, get more clients on board too, to kind of bridge the gap in that direction also. And we post um, twice a week in there. We have weekly discussion posts, resource posts. We talk about motivational interviewing a lot. And we also do a monthly Q&A and all those members also get um, discounts to our upcoming webinar series. So we'll be covering the Bridging the Gap um, series once again and the Comprehensive Coaching Framework. And we're also going to be covering um, the spectrum of intentional eating and some client-specific um, webinars at the end of the year too. Wow, awesome. That sounds like a really good resource for people to be able to utilize. Well, guys, we hope that you enjoyed this episode. If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. You can find um, Gabrielle on all those social media handles and, and Facebook groups. And you can find me at Christy Lynn Fit and Marissa at Marissa Roy Fitness. Thank you guys so much for listening. We hope that you enjoy this episode and we will see you back next week.